Good afternoon and welcome. I'm Tom Castaneda with South Texas Health System. We are a proud corporate sponsor of the Mission Chamber of Commerce, and I am also a proud native of Mission. So I will be your MC for today. Thank you so much for joining us for this very special legislative update. Now our distinguished guests are en route, so we are going to start the beginning of the program and then we'll continue once they get here with the actual moderating of the panel discussion. But we are honored to have U.S. Senator Juan, U.S. State Senator Juan Chuina Hosa and Texas State Representative Sergio Munoz Jr. with us today. And we thank them for taking the time out of their busy schedule to be here with us. On that note, I'd also like to take this time to recognize and thank Mayor Nori Garza, our Mission City Council members who are in the audience today, and any elected officials joining us, if y'all could please stand and be recognized. A round of applause for them, and thank you for all that you do for the City of Mission and for the Rio Grande Valley. Now, for those football fans in the audience today, how many of there are you guys are here? How many of you? Right, I, I think it's pretty full. I mean, if you grew up in Mission, you're a football fan. Well, we have the honor of having Mr. Travis Bush, Travis Bush with us here today. He is UTRGV's first football coach. Do you want to stand, sir? And I know they do have season, you can already request your season passes. So they have forms available at their table. They're $25 each, I believe, for, for the set. I hope that's the price, or is it each ticket? But go and talk to Mr. Bush, and he will give you all the information you need. Now, ladies and gentlemen, at this time, please rise for the presentation of colors led by the City of Mission Police Department, and please remain standing for the Pledge of Allegiance and invocation by GMCC President Brenda Enriquez. Let us please bow our heads and come together in prayer. Dear God, we are gathered here today as a caring and tight-knit community to break bread and celebrate our communal respect for each other and that of the individuals and businesses of greater mission. We are grateful for the nourishment we are about to partake and for the presence of our civic leaders who represent us every day. God, you know our hearts and thoughts. Please allow us to take wisdom and apply it to the gifts that we share with others each day. We are servants because of you. In Jesus' name, amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, you may be seated. And at this time, I'd like to invite City of Mission Mayor Nori Garza to the podium for an official welcome to the City of Mission. Thank you very much, and I want to welcome all of you for being here. I know that y'all are very, very busy, and I really appreciate you taking time to spend some time here in Mission in our beautiful Mission Event Center. So, good afternoon, um, and I want to thank the Chamber, actually, for making this a Buenas Tardes luncheon, because it used to be a Buenos Dias at 7.15 in the morning, and so that was a great change. I'm just kidding. It's always a pleasure to attend the Chamber's Buenas Tardes Luncheon as it gives me an opportunity to connect with the business community. 
The council and I take great pride in our stakeholders within our community and it's important that you know that we're here to support you. I'm excited to welcome my good friends, State Senator Juan Chu Hinojosa and State Representative Sergio Munoz Jr. Representative Bobby Guerra was hoping to be here, but he called, he sent his regrets and he was not able to come. I would like to publicly thank them for working so hard to make sure that the Valley has the same opportunities, if not even more, than the rest of the state. And I really, really do appreciate that. Um, I think that, that y'all can take a look around and see all the improvements that have been made as far as infrastructure and, and uh, road improvements. I know it's kind of a, uh, a hassle to have to wait to, to get to the other side of uh, the valley, but, but it'll get there. Um, so it's all because of them. Uh, I'm sure that, that this legislative session has already been very busy, and I appreciate the time that they've taken, that they will take to be here. Of course, they are on route. The chamber and the city are hosting Mission Day in Austin on the first week of February, so we're going to be knocking on their doors with our legislative ass and our hands wide open. We already have been working on, on our agenda for, for this budget, and um, we're hoping for great things to come in the City of Mission. Thank you all for supporting the organization that supports interest of their members and influences pro-business policies. Thank you, Brenda. Thank you, staff and the Board of Directors for your dedication and commitment to our city and our growth. Before I close, I would like to invite all our guests to the annual Texas Citrus Fiesta Parade next Saturday, uh, which is January the 28th at noon. So that's a, that's a big event for the City of Mission and I, event, I invite all of you to attend. It'll be, it'll be great. Thank you so much and God bless all of you. Thank you. And at this time, I'd like to welcome GMCC Board Chairman and CEO of Apple Pharmacy, Mr. Joe Vargas. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a wonderful day uh, here in Mission. And it's so uplifting to see this room full of wonderful supporters, investors. Uh, we couldn't make this afternoon possible if it wasn't for your support and for your contributions. I stand before you as a chairman for the Greater Mission Chamber of Commerce, representing my good friends, the board of directors of the Mission Chamber, who works exhaustly for our mission businesses as we continue to look for ways that we can grow and in economic development and other ways that we can be of service to all of our business owners, both here in the city of Mission and our neighboring cities who are great members to the, to the Greater Mission Chamber of Commerce. And on behalf of the board, I would like to recognize the very nice people, the businesses that made this afternoon possible. To our investors, Mission CISD, thank you. Dr. Perez, I believe, is here, our superintendent. Thank you so very much for your support. To the City of Mission, to Cano and Sons Trucking, South Texas Health Systems, Mission EDC, Mission Regional Medical Center, International Bank of Commerce, Aidomar, Bert Ogden, RGV, and today's title sponsor, Texas Regional Bank. Thank you very much. I'd also like to recognize today's business sponsor, which is our very own Mission EDC. Round of applause for them. I would also like to take this time to recognize our table sponsors here present today. Radisson Hotel, McAllen Airport, Valley Land Title, Leinberger, Goggin, Blair, and Sampson, Social Life Magazine, Charter Communications, Almaguer Law Firm, Walsh, McGurk, Cordova, Nixon, International Bank of Commerce, Texas Gas Service, One Gas, Vintage Bank, Plains Capital Bank, Edward Jones, 
Key Mortgage, Sherryland ISD Education Foundation, and Bert Ogden. Once again, thank you very much for your support and thank you for being here this afternoon. To close, without the support of our sponsors and the investors, our work could not move forward. And so wholeheartedly today, I would like to say thank you. May you continue to support the great work of the great city of Mission and the Greater Chamber of Commerce. But more importantly, may we continue to help one another to prosper and succeed in this challenging world. God bless you all. As mentioned earlier, the title sponsor of today's event is Texas Regional Bank, and it is my honor to now present the Assistant Vice President of Business Development for Texas Regional Bank, Ms. Jamie Brown Rosas. Jamie? Thank you, Tom. Uh, I'm still waiting for you to kind of come up with those um, MC lessons. You know, you get up here and you're just, you're so natural. So I'm waiting to take those, those classes from you. Hello, everyone. On behalf of Texas Regional Bank and my colleagues here today, um, I'd like to say buenas tardes and welcome. Welcome you to this highly anticipated event. I'd also like to express how proud Texas Regional Bank is uh, to be here today serving as the title sponsor, a day where we collectively, uh, we come together to gain information, important information and updates uh, about our community and its future. Like most in this room, my colleagues and I do keep abreast of what's going on uh, and coming out of Austin while remembering our roots. Texas Regional Bank proudly has its roots here in the Rio Grande Valley with branches spanning from Mission to Brownsville. We're in the Texas Hill Country. We're in Houston. Uh, we just added the DFW area to our team, expanding our footprint across the state to 28 locations and growing. So just kind of to digress for a second, if you paid attention to that last part, you know that many of the areas that we're in have institutions of higher education, colleges and universities. So parents of college students or future college students, if you're looking for an easy way to send money over to, to, uh, to your children, we're here for you. I, I tried to kind of not put a shameless plug into this presentation, but there it was. Um, but since today is centered around uh, history happening in Austin, I'm excited to share the news that last week we officially opened our Austin location at 1001 Congress Avenue, one block south of the Capitol. You can clap, you can clap for that. <laughs> so when our elected officials do maybe want to take a break, step outside for a, a breath of fresh air, they'll see a familiar name on the building right down the block and, and know that they're always welcome in our home. At Texas Regional Bank, we work hard each day to be the people you know in the communities we serve. And going forward into 2023, our focus continues to be on growth as we seek out opportunities to help our community achieve their goals, your goals, and celebrate your successes. To close, I'd like to thank uh, Senator Hinojosa and Representative Munoz for taking time out of their busy schedules to join us. And I really wanna give a huge shout out to CJ and Brenda and the whole team at the Greater Mission Chamber for putting together this great event. Thank you. All right, another round of applause for Jamie. 
It is now officially time to get started with our panel discussion with our legislators. Um, I'd like to turn it over to our moderator for today's program, Mr. Craig Burley, who currently serves as the Public Relations and Marketing Director for Mission CISD. He brings to the panel more than a dozen years of experience in the broadcast news industry, serving in roles ranging from news director to reporter, photographer, and anchor. After six years at KGBT TV, where we worked together, he switched gears and entered the world of school communications. Over the past 24 years, he has earned a solid reputation amongst his peers statewide and among the area media representatives. He's not only an award-winning broadcast journalist, but he has also earned numerous awards from the Texas School Public Relations Association, including the TSPRA Professional Achievement Award. He is a trusted resource among Texas school communicators in his role role at Mission CISD. He has helped grow and strengthen the ties between the district and the communities it serves. At this time, please welcome Craig Verley. Good afternoon, everybody. And I would like to uh, say a special thank you too to the uh, Greater Mission Chamber of Commerce for uh, honoring me with coming before you all to moderate this little panel discussion with our esteemed representatives who are already busy up in Austin since the legislative session has already started. We do appreciate you all taking the time to meet with everyone uh, this afternoon and uh, share some important information as we move along. We're gonna jump right into it as we've only got about uh, 25, 30 minutes to try and share as much as we can about everything. Um, we're gonna start off basically talking uh, dollars and cents a little bit. Um, so far, the uh, Texas Comptroller of Public Accounts, uh, Mr. Glenn Hager, has already announced what kind of money is going to be available for uh, everyone in Austin to think about trying to divvy up amongst all of the needs across the state of Texas. And they're looking at about a 26% increase uh, for the uh, legislative budget cycle this year, which he has indicated is kind of a once in a lifetime opportunity for you all to consider as you uh, delegate and do your various uh, decision making up there. What kind of historic actions do you think would be able to come out of uh, having that kind of surplus to uh, add to the budget this year? Senator, we'll start with you. Well, first of all, uh, thank you very much for inviting us to um, at least give you an update on what's happening up in Austin with this coming session. Uh, we were sworn in last week uh, on uh, Tuesday, uh, went to the inaugural for Governor Abbott and Lieutenant Governor Patrick, uh, and the first couple of weeks they usually spent organizing and uh, attending receptions and dinners and what have you, and most of us uh, are anxious to get right down to the nitty gritty of working on legislation, especially the budget, uh, and uh, you're correct, uh, our state uh, has a very strong economy. Uh, it is the ninth largest uh, economy in the world. And we've been very fortunate, very fortunate that we have $32.7 billion surplus. That is not including uh, approximately $17 billion uh, that we have in the rainy day fund. Uh, so we have plenty of money. In addition to that, uh, we will have um, at least $5 billion left over from the CARE Act that's still available for us to spend. Uh, that's for federal funds. We also have about 4.9 billion under the American Rescue Act, uh, and we'll have a lot more money coming in uh, through uh, broadband uh, funding from the federal government. Uh, and while we have a large surplus, uh, we cannot spend it all. Uh, we have a constitutional limit on how much money we can spend, uh, and we will spend at least anywhere from 12 to 15 billion dollars. Keep in mind that this is just for the regular budget. Uh, there is also what's called a supplemental budget. We can also, we have room, I think up to five billion, seven billion dollars to be able to spend uh, on state agencies, Medicaid, and other programs where there may be a shortfall. But what we're focused on uh, is taking, making, 
one-time commitment to many of the areas uh, that are a priority for us as a state. Uh, besides taking care of our teachers with a pay raise, uh, doing a 13 check for retired uh, teachers, uh, dealing with a pay raise uh, for state employees, uh, 5% uh, the first year, another 5% the second year, uh, focusing on mental health, uh, investing in the billions, an additional $3 billion. Right now we have about $8.7 billion uh, across all the mental health agencies. Uh, so we very much focus uh, on infrastructure. Uh, we wanna make sure that now that we have the funds, that we focus on our ports, that we focus on broadband, that we focus on our highways uh, and bridges, uh, and just as important, on, on flood mitigation, uh, and, and focusing uh, on increasing our water capacity, which is very important. Uh, so we, we intend to make some of those lifetime investments that will continue to return benefits uh, for years to come. Uh, these are not, uh, it's an opportunity that we cannot pass up, uh, that we will not experience in our lifetimes, uh, that we as a state uh, don't have the same challenges that other states are having. California, for example, I think that's a $40 billion deficit. Uh, New York uh, is struggling uh, just to keep up even with their budget. Uh, so here in Texas, we are very lucky and very fortunate. For us, we, uh, you know, while we, the budget that was uh, presented that came out yesterday, we have had a chance to adjust all the numbers. Uh, it's over a thousand pages long, uh, and my staff uh, is going through it. Our staff are going through it, analyzing the funding, for example, there was an increase of funding for our medical school, uh, an additional $2 billion. Same thing for um, uh, the focus on our international bridges here in the valley, focus on flooding. Uh, we plan to focus and uh, invest another $344 million uh, on the state hospital in Harlingen. Uh, we, I mean, we, we are really, uh, have a lot of money, but we gotta use it wisely we will have quite a bit of left over. And the reason for that is that we anticipate that we may end up having a reception. Uh, but the reception for Texas will be uh, not as severe, and we don't expect it to be a severe recession, recession nationwide. But here in Texas, we're ready. We're prepared. Uh, and we also plan to focus on our rural law enforcement along the border. Uh, the, our sheriffs and deputies uh, do a lot of work, work together with our city. I see um, Chief Torres here. Uh, they work with DPS. Uh, they work with our federal uh, partners. But uh, the Sheriff's Department across the state in South Texas are really uh, uh, understaffed uh, and underpaid. I could go on and on, but I'll let my friend <laughs> handle some of that. Uh, but we will hopefully focus on many of the priorities that in the past have been a lack of shortage of funds, which we now have available. Uh, and, and let me just, one, one more point, this is important. This additional funding by the federal government uh, up to $39 billion that's being sent directly to many of our transportation and highway projects throughout the state of Texas. Uh, and, I, and I'll stop with that. And, okay. It can be dangerous giving a PR person and two politicians a microphone and a stage, so. <laughs> Representative from the House side of things, with, with the, the uh, extra funds that seem to be available this year, what kind of opportunities are you looking at? Well, I, uh, I would just agree with uh, what the Senator mentioned. It's, it's a once in a lifetime opportunity in, in terms of investing. The one thing that we have to do, I think, is uh, give a pay raise to our state employees and try to ramp up the staffing in a lot of our state agencies. You know, we have many uh, constituents that come by our office that have uh, concerns or that have issues that arise with some of the state agencies and it's always very challenging uh, to try to get them resolved because um, it's been a long time coming for us to make sure that we have uh, the individuals that are needed uh, within our state agencies and that we take care of them and that you make the pay competitive enough that people wanna work for the state. That's one of the challenges that we always face like with the private sector is that people uh, look at what they're gonna make versus what they can make in, in the private sector. And of course, 
you know, they would make the choice in terms of uh, their decision to, to go forward. So the other thing I would say is that um, the teacher retirement is going to be something that they're going to look at. I know the senator mentioned that, especially on the Senate side, they're already looking at not only the uh, retirement system, but also doing another check like we did the last session. Um, the supplemental budget, I think, is going to be extremely important because there are some uh, bills to say that, that, that still need to be taken care of from the current budget cycle that will end uh, this coming September. But there are many opportunities that we have, and as the Senator mentioned, uh, using the money wisely, but we know that if we put it into economic development, we put it into education, and we would put it into our healthcare system, overall, that's a safety net for everybody that lives here in the state. So. We're hoping that we work together like we always have with the Senate, that the priorities are in line on the budget and that we make a wise use of the funds that are going to be available. Let, let me add a couple more. You know, I'm, I'm vice chair of finance, uh, so I get to see all the numbers across the board. There are two areas that we always get many concerns, complaints by our constituents. Number one, property taxes. Uh, so we uh, plan to increase the homestead exemption up to $70,000. Uh, they'll cost about $3 billion. So we plan to put that in the constitutional amendment so the voters can vote so that it will not count towards the spending cap. Uh, we also plan to increase the exemption for the business tax. I think right now it's $25,000. Uh, we're going to increase that to over 100000 uh, because we feel that's really a nuisance tax on uh, our small business uh, com uh, community. And if, if you'll see what uh, is happening, you keep up with, uh, with the changes that are taking place and the reports by the press, we're also starting to focus very much on providing certificates, uh, providing social degrees, uh, providing training through the Workforce Commission, uh, partnering with our community colleges and the private sector uh, and, and many of the other nonprofit training uh, institutions and uh, uh, nonprofits that exist. The reason for that is that our economy is changing. Uh, we have a large high demand for jobs, but we don't have the skilled labor to fill those jobs. And these are not minimum wage jobs. These are high paying jobs. So we are now switching over and investing uh, hundreds of millions of dollars uh, to provide that training through SDC, uh, through TSTI in, in uh, Harlingen, uh, and also uh, dealing with uh, the universities to try to coordinate and have from high school uh, to community colleges to four-year institutions, but getting very much involved partnering with the private sector to identify those jobs where we can provide the training that's needed so they can be unemployable. Now, uh, last count, there was well over 150 bills that have been filed aiming to provide some sort of property tax relief to everyone. I see the smiles already. So we'll start with you, Representative, on this one. What? What are the odds of there being something um, tangible happening in terms of additional property tax relief for businesses and the average person? Well, I just think it's sometimes a coincidence that we start the session in January and then uh, you get your tax bill to pay right at the end of the month. So uh, there's always a lot of interest when it comes to the uh, property taxes. But uh, the senator mentioned it and I think it's something that uh, that they're looking at on the House side is one, the homestead exemption to be increased. Um, there is an overall discussion uh, that we have in the state session after session, which is the amount of tax that's collected, where it's spent, how does that benefit the actual regular person off the street, right? Uh, the regular homeowner, regular citizen, what benefit do they get uh, from not only being able to own their home, but not making it seem that in the grand scheme of things, you feel like you're renting versus owning because with the property taxes itself, it seems like you're never gonna get out of it. But one of the things I would just add to it is, um, you know, there's a, there's a certain percentage of, of, of uh, people and it's happened to all of us, uh, you know, paying the property taxes on time and sometimes we ask for, you know, a month or two later. And uh, all of a sudden you see a huge increase in the penalties and interest that, that come through, right? 
So for uh, individuals that are trying to bring that down and, and become current, it seems like they're never able to get past that because the penalties and interest just start accumulating, 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 and it's never enough. So I think, in my personal opinion, that we have to look in a way uh, to maybe not for that to be so high, but to maybe bring it down to not a little bit more reasonable so that people that do need a little bit extra help can pay but can ha you know won't be dealing with this cycle about the penalties and interest just accumulating over time. Um, I do feel that that as a state, the the biggest uh, I guess uh, issue that they raise to us is well that you know the state of Texas you don't collect property taxes, so why do you all have a say in, in anything that happens? But uh, as we've seen sef session after session, it is something that has been taken seriously uh, by the legislature, and there have been. Uh, many conversations that they've had with local government in terms of taxes and, and them being raised. But I think at the end of the day for the average person and, and, and for all of us here, we just wanna make sure that if we are paying taxes, they're being uh, put to good use and that we're getting the services that we should be have, so. Very good, Senator. Yeah, well, for me, um, being uh, every session, there are about 6,000 bills filed. Uh, most of them get nowhere uh, and I usually focus on the issues that are brought forth, that are brought to me by my constituents. Uh, local bills to fix problems, uh, to improve uh, education or, the, or take care of certain needs that arise, uh, whether it's here in the Rio Grande Valley uh, or up in Corpus Christi, because my district goes up to Nueces County. But more important to me is the funding. Uh, I wanna make sure that we get our share of resources. Uh, that our university, our medical school, there are bridges for infrastructure, uh, our highways, you know, we still have the power interchange being worked on, over $300 million, uh, the La Jolla bypass, uh, we are now seeing the growth go north of Mission and McAllen. Uh, we're now putting more funding to that. So aside from all that, every session I end up with about 85 to 90 bills. Uh, a, a variety of issues that I deal with from education to mental health, criminal law, uh, and, and I end up also picking up bills from a delegation, uh, the bills they, send, they pass out and send over to the Senate, so I carry those bills. Keep in mind that many times uh, there's legislation that's being proposed, uh, but it's a process. Uh, the bill will be filed uh, and people will be they don't like it, or there's a pushback, or there's a strong push for it, but the process itself lends uh, itself to let people come and testify, to people express your opinions. We listen to people who specialize in whatever area it is, whether it's mental health, whether it's property taxes, whether it's uh, education, uh, whatever the issue is. Uh, and in the process itself, uh, that piece of legislation many times gets amended. Uh, gets modified and edited uh, to really get to focus on the problem and not have unintended consequences. So the process itself uh, is not a simple one. Uh, you have you have anybody come and testify on any issue that you like to testify, uh, and it's really a true democracy. This is an important point. You know, the press, uh, with all due respect, uh, they give. Almost 90% are the coverage to maybe one or two percent of the issues, uh, the, what you call the red meat issues. <clears throat> the majority of bills are nonpartisan. They're not Republican. They're not Democrat. They're just bills. They're legislation on how do we make government work, how do we fix problems that exist uh, that we found out through feedback that we receive from the general public, uh, or by those that are in their profession. I mean, so the issues that we deal with, what I call the bread and butter issues, uh, don't get the proper coverage by the press because the press is very much interested on the hot issues, right? Um, critical theory uh, or um, LGBT rights, uh, and rightly so. Uh, but the majority of issues we deal with, they have nothing to do with those issues. We, we really focus uh, on making sure that jobs are available, making sure that our economy remains strong, making sure we address education. Uh, public school safety has become a big issue. Uh, we, the, the, 
we, we set aside $600 million to help our public schools increase public safety. Uh, that's on top of $400 million that we appropriated during the interim. So we, we are trying to respond to the needs uh, that you all bring to our attention uh, because we depend on that to be able to move forward on legislation. Uh, and so I end up probably with about 90 piece of legislation, uh, but I will tell you that for us, staff is key. Uh, without our staff, we couldn't do the work we do. Uh, they also they meet with constituents, they take phone calls, they help us draft legislation, they give us feedback because they have a lot of experience, they interact with other staff people, uh, to get an idea how other settlers or what other staff are thinking. It's, it's a really a, a collaborative uh, teamwork process. Uh, even though it doesn't seem that way, uh, in campaigns, you know, I say, well, well those, the, those Republicans, and then, no, those Democrats. After the campaign is over, we're out there drinking a glass of wine, drinking coffee, you know, talking about real issues. We know there are issues that separate us, uh, but the majority of issues are not uh, those red meat issues. Uh, those are done for campaigns. Uh, we get down to a nitty gritty and uh, of working on the real issues, how to make government work, how to improve the quality of life for all of us. And Senator, a little bit earlier, you mentioned that uh, you know the importance of focusing on the issues that the constituents bring you all from your office and your standpoint, for the average person, the average business owner, what is the best way for them to engage with you to let you know about what's important to them and the bills that are coming forward? You know, we have uh, an open door policy uh, and I pride myself because I'm probably one of the few senators that makes the time to meet uh, with constituents when they come to the state capitol. Uh, I have an office in McAllen, Edinburgh, and Corpus Christi, and Austin. Uh, you want to talk to me? Call, set an appointment, uh, email, uh, and, and I will talk to you. Uh, and if I'm not available, you can you, you probably talk, talk to Roxy De La Garza, my, my deputy chief of staff, she's sitting over there, uh, Luis Moreno. Uh, we'll make time. And if we have to, we'll, we can do it by uh, Zoom call. You know, I didn't know what Zoom was before the pandemic, man. I thought it was Zumba, you know, <laughs> a dance. Uh, but I learned how to use Zoom very efficiently so that we can also talk uh, and tell me what you think. Uh, and, and we'll explain sometimes and, and clarify issues and legislation for you that you're concerned about. Uh, but just communicate. You know, we, we see anybody that comes to our office at the state capitol. Same thing here. Uh, and the reality is, uh, in my district, runs all the way to Corpus Christi, almost a million people in my Senate district. Uh, it's bigger than a congressional district. So you can imagine uh, the number of calls and invitations we receive. Uh, it, it, even if I did 24-7, did nothing but attend invites, uh, it would not be enough. I'll probably cover less than 3%, 4%. Uh, but when it comes to constituents calling, we always deal with them, we respond, we answer the letters, we answer the phone calls, uh, and, and set appointments, uh, and we make ourselves available. Uh, if not me personally, because uh, I may, I may be uh, in committee hearings, uh, certainly my staff I will talk to you. And sometimes I, I joke, but in reality, uh, I'm like a figurehead just. It's my staff that really does the work. <laughs> So sometimes, they, sometimes I get people come in there, well, we don't want to talk to you, Senator. We want to talk to your staff. I want to talk to your chief of staff, Luis Moreno. I want to talk to Roxy de la Garza. You know, and, and that's, um, <laughs> um, that's how you communicate with us. <laughs> Representative, from your end? Yeah, I will say that uh, the Senator mentioned communication is extremely important, and really sometimes a lot of the uh, legislation that we found that we propose come from constituents that come to our office and that bring about concerns or issues that have arisen for themselves or for their family. And that's where we do a little bit more research and we look and, and we say, you know what, there are changes to the law that need to be made or maybe some administrative rule, et cetera, that also needs to be looked at that is not fulfilling its purpose anymore or that has to maybe uh, be modified a little bit so that it's um, impacting uh, people in a positive way and not in a negative. But I will also encourage uh, individuals to either come to our district office or if you're in Austin, to go to the Capitol office. 
uh, email us or call us and, and send us your concerns or your comments. And if there's particular legislation that you're following or that you would want us to look at in terms of proposing as well, uh, because all of that at the end, I think is what makes the legislative process uh, impactful to everybody. And that's uh, one, having a great line of communication and also making sure that we're addressing the needs that are brought to us. And, and let me add, you know, the, in the state capital, there are a lot of people now that it's uh, wide open. During the pandemic, uh, it was pretty much shut down, uh, very much controlled. Everybody had to get tested. And now it's, it's open. Uh, and the lobbyists certainly are not shy. Uh, when I walk from my state capital office to the finance committee, uh, I have a whole bunch of lobbyists walking right by me, asking me questions or giving me information on their whoever they represent. Uh, and I tell you something funny, the guys, not the women, sometimes they'll follow you into the bathroom, right? So you see, as you're there and they're talking to you. Uh, so it's really, a, uh, seems like a chaos, but I call it controlled chaos. <laughs> seems like a contradiction, you know, but it, that's the reality of what we deal with up there. I think we all kind of understand that aspect. Um, representative, you all are fixing to really get into the meat, meat and potatoes of the, the session here. In about a minute or so, give us an idea of what your main priorities are, are looking at for you and your staff. The main thing that we want to do is uh, go back to the resources that are available and making sure that we're getting our fair share, not only for our district, but for the Rio Grande Valley. It's uh, something that I know we work very closely with the Senator uh, session after session is making sure that we bring back, uh, bring home the bacon, right? Like they say, <laughs> as best as we can, because we really are in a position to where we have uh, many opportunities. We have a lot of talent, talent. We have a lot of individuals that live here in the Valley that need opportunities. And anything that we can do in whatever aspect to make sure that we create those opportunities for people within our district and the Rio Grande Valley at the end of the day impacts all of us here. So whether that's investing more in education, in our healthcare system, making sure that we uh, do more for our universities and that they offer more training, more programs, even if it's vocational training or certificates. At the end of the day, if somebody's life is impacted in a positive way, and they improve the quality of life for themselves and for their family that benefits all of us. So the drive for all of us, and I'm sure that in working with the Senator is making sure that we can do the best that we can to not only represent our constituents, but bring as many resources as we can uh, to the Rio Grande Valley as a whole. You know, for me, I, I focus on what I call the bread and butter issues. Uh, tortillas, arroz, and frijoles, right? Jobs. Healthcare, education, our first responders, uh, mental health, you know, I, the issues that impact our families on a daily basis, food banks. Uh, I carry a lot of uh, legislation dealing with making sure that the food banks get proper funding to help people that for whatever reason uh, don't have the food to feed their families. Uh, I also deal with a lot of family violence uh, legislation uh, because during the pandemic, it seems like uh, family violence increased because people were isolated. Uh, child abuse. Uh, I, I, so I, every issue uh, that I can identify, that I know, some families, someone from my district talked to me about it, brought this to my attention. You have adv advocacy groups like CASA that represent uh, children who uh, need advocacy uh, in in, in the court in the court uh, system, so we fund those. I mean, I focus on those issues to try to help the, make life better and, and have a better quality of life for all of us. Uh, I, I I don't. I, mean, I even do a uh, deal, deal with uh, funding for Boys and Girls Club. Make sure we put the money in there. I deal with all this cross range of issues uh, because for me uh, it's important. Uh, have empathy. Uh, you know, I, I grew up uh, <laughs> with a family of 11. My father was a truck driver and, and, and my mother was a migrant farm worker. So I know how it is to struggle to put food on the table. I know how, it's, how hard it is when you don't even get a decent living wage. Uh, we focus on all those issues. I know how it is with healthcare. I mean, we have uh, cost continues to go up, prescription drugs continue to go up. I mean, those, those are very real issues that our family is faced with. So I keep an open eye on that, uh, and during the, especially during the finance uh, hearings where each state agency comes to testify before the finance committee. Uh, when I see that, 
if I see a reduction in funding, I push. The almost $300 billion budget that we are starting with is just a base budget. Uh, for that, we'll be able to add billions of dollars more as we go through the process. Uh, just because we have the funding uh, and because some funding programs are neglected because there's a, not, there's a lack of advocacy many times for those groups. Uh, so those of us who've been elected to public office and who you give us the trust to make those decisions for you, we look uh, and identify those areas. And I ask my staff, did they fund CASA? Uh, is there funding for Mujeres Unidas? Uh, how, how do we do for the Boys and Girls Club? So, I mean, th those are also efficacy groups that really are very active in our communities that very, play, play very much an important part for us. So, I, yeah, so we do that. The Workforce Commission, I'll bring up another one. Uh, it's important we fund them because they, they're the ones that provide a lot of grants. Uh, we just lost, well, we didn't lose him, Julian Alvarez, who was the, uh, he from the Valle, from the Valley. I, I used to call him Santa Claus because he would bring grants all the time here to the Valley, 200,000, 150,000, uh, half a million dollars on different programs for Workforce Commission. So we, we focus on all those uh, programs. I think there were one more, but I, I guess I haven't seen your moment there. I forgot the other issues I'll talk about because it's just uh, as important. Gentlemen, I believe we are uh, reached our limit on the time for, for today. We appreciate the time that you've taken to visit with all of us, and I would encourage everyone to engage with these gentlemen when you have those opportunities. They are very approachable. One of the biggest challenges about sitting up here right now has been referring to them as senator and representative because they are people that you can approach and calling them by formal titles is almost kind of awkward for me when I'm sitting up here in some of that, but don't be afraid to let your voice be heard. Gentlemen, we do appreciate what you do for us in Austin and throughout the year um, as our representatives. One. And, and I just want to say thank you for your time and attention. And I apologize for not trying to, uh, not looking at the audience, but that light was like right in my face the whole time and I don't have a hat. So, um, <laughs> what do you take it off? <laughs> <laughs> but, but I do want to just reiterate what we heard already and uh, please reach out to us and, and not only here in the district, but if you're in Austin, you're at the Capitol, your family is there, let us know. We would be more than happy to give you a tour or you can come by the office and, I mean, there's a lot of history and so many great things in that building, and it really is uh, truly a landmark uh, for us here in our state. So please come by, visit us, and let us know if we can host you or your family. We'd be more than happy to do that. And thank you very much for your time, and God bless each and every one of you. Thank you. Thank you. CJ. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is CJ Sanchez. I'm the Vice President for the Greater Mission Chamber of Commerce. We'd like to thank once again our distinguished guests for being here with us. So a special thank you and round of applause once again for State Senator Juan Chuy Hinojosa and uh, Texas State's uh, Representative Sergio Munoz Jr. And of course to our gracious um, moderator for today, Mr. Craig Burley, for all three of you all gifting your time with us today. Thank you so much. Another round of applause for them. The Mission Chamber Board and Directors and Staff would like to thank everybody who helped make today's event possible. Starting with, once again, a huge thank you to our title sponsor and all of our table sponsors. Um, Texas Regional Bank, thank you so much. Jamie, it's a pleasure working with you. And a special shout out to our former uh, chairman, Cesar Suarez, for all the support that we continue to get from you and, and the bank. So thank you guys so much for today and for making this event possible. Um, I'd also like to thank all of the, the, the behind the scenes, the crew that uh, helped us out here today, uh, the City of Missions media team, as well as the Mix Academy for um, providing the AV equipment for today. I'd like to thank our caterers, Cornerstone Catering, for um, putting together today's delicious meal. So thank you to all of, to, to them for participating today. Um, and also, last but not least, we'd like, I'd like to thank the GMCC Board of Directors. Um, we appreciate the continued support. Those of you all that are here, please stand to, to be recognized. You guys are I'd like to thank the rest of the GMCC team, our, our 
uh, CEO and President, Ms. Brenda Enriquez, to Jennifer, Candice, Jose, and Priscilla, everyone worked tirelessly behind the scenes to make today's possible, to, to make today's, today's event possible. So once again, thank you to our chamber investors, thank you to our table sponsors, and buenas tardes. Thank you so much for being here.